Hey there, welcome to another episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog I'm going to show you the interview that I did with the godfather of Dutch dance music, Ben Liebrand. Enjoy! Ben Liebrand was born on September 27, 1960 in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. At the age of 16, he began his DJ career with his own mobile drive-in show. Around 1979-1980, he learned the art of mixing. Ben was resident DJ in clubs such as The Queen and Kaiser Karel in the Netherlands and also in Mega Club The Hippodrome in Germany. On the 1st of April 1983, Ben Liebron started with a weekly one-hour mix show on Dutch radio station Veronica. This show was called In The Mix and it was the very first non-stop mix show on Dutch radio. In the mix ran from 1983 to 1985 and was followed by the mini mix. This was also a weekly item where Ben made a short mix of a few tracks or a brand new remix of an existing track. Some mini mixes even got a commercial release. The most well known example is probably the remix Ben did of the Phil Collins classic In the Air Tonight. This one started as a mini mix but when it got the attention of Virgin Records they wanted to release it as an official remix. It sold over 250,000 copies back in 1998. Ben furthermore did remixes for artists such as Bill Withers, NXS, Sting, TLC, Grace Jones, Salt and Peppa, Hot Chocolate, Blondie, The Four Seasons, Alexander O'Neill, Cool and the Gang, The Bee Gees, Armin van Buren, 24 7, Culture Beat, Jam and Spoon and many many more. And of course Ben Liebrand is responsible for the legendary Grand Mixes. In 1983 he made his first Grand Mix which featured over 100 of the year's best tracks in a one hour non-stop mix. The Grand Mix did air at the end of December on Dutch radio. The Grand Mix became an annual tradition and it inspired many to become DJs themselves. Some of the guys that listen to the mixes of Ben are now world famous DJs including Ferry Korsten, Tiesto and Armin van Buren. Ben is one of the very few people in the music business who takes care of his own programming, arranging, keyboards, engineering, mixing and mastering. Plus, since 1991, Ben started with image composing and 3D animation. So he's taking care of his own visuals, video clips and artwork. But he also did VJ visuals for Armin van Buren, Marcus Schulz, Mike Bush and many others. Ben is active for over 35 years in the music business. These days he lives in Canada but he's still flying to the Netherlands several times a year for DJ bookings. In March I had the honor to speak to Ben in the city of Nijmegen, the place where it all started for him. We are here in Nijmegen, the city where you were born and where you started your career. Uh, you started with your own mobile drive-in show and later you learned how to mix. Can you tell us a bit more about that time? Uh, for me it was a time um, that I got uh, to know uh, audio equipment uh, at the same time as uh, music. So uh, for me it was a discovery of uh, bands like uh, Kraftwerk, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre and at the same time uh, enjoying the equipment, uh, quadraphonic sound and that kind of stuff um, to play the music on. So it was an adventure both in music and both in uh, uh, technology that uh, got me interested in all of this and uh, I did have my uh, drive-in show, uh, my drive-in gig thing, where I had my two turntables, a mixer, cassette player, and uh, by the time I was satisfied with my setup, I felt the chance of anybody spilling a glass of beer in it, uh, such a risk that I never took it out of the house anymore. Do you remember on which decks you learned DJ? And is it true that these turntables had no pitch control? Uh, the first decks I had uh, just to play music on were uh, Philips turntables. Uh, I think it were the 312s. And they didn't have pitch back then. Uh, I kind of hacked them that I, can that I could start and stop the track without the arm lifting automatically. Uh, and the first one after that were uh, dual turntables. And I they might have had pitch, but they were just so uh, finicky that you know whenever you looked at the turntable sideways, uh, the needle would skip, let alone touching the platter or trying to make an adjustment. So that was very difficult to do. You influenced many Dutch DJs such as Tiesto, Armin van Buren, Ferry Korsten, etc. But in the time you started, DJing was still very new. So who influenced you? Um, the thing was, when I started DJing, um, there was no YouTube. Um, 
there was, you couldn't call anybody, there was no DJ scene, uh, so you just had to figure out everything for yourself. Um, and being, uh, you know, the young nerd I was, uh, I was very interested in how all that worked. Um, first DJ I heard mixing, mixing was uh, Hype Luiter, and what uh, grabbed my attention that he was playing um, M pop music way too fast, and I was wondering why he was doing that. And only during that evening I found out that he kind of weaved the records together uh, tempo-wise and. Pop music was a rather slow track, so that's why he sped it up so he could mix it. Uh, Hype didn't care about um, BPMs, he didn't care about uh, a key or whatever. Uh, he also didn't, probably didn't know or didn't even care what a BPM was. Uh, I saw on the French Vanguard label that there was a number on there. Uh, it said 117 and then I saw another one which said 132 and I saw another one and then it kind of dawned on me would that be the tempo of the track and that's how I found out uh, that these numbers were the actual BPM so I kind of found out the meaning of those numbers before I learned the meaning of BPM Again, just by trying and being a nerd about it and wanting to get to the, the bottom of how things worked. Um, yeah, that got me into uh, uh, mixing and rearranging my record boxes tempo-wise so I could more, you know, make a, a more gradual progression through the evening. This year, 35 years ago, back in 1983, you started your show In The Mix at Dutch radio station Veronica. This was the very first non-stop mix show on Dutch radio. After two years, In The Mix got replaced for the item The Mini Mix. Each week you made a new remix of a track and sometimes those remixes even got an official release. Can you tell us a bit more about The Mini Mix and how it started? Yeah, so as you said, um, 1983 uh, was uh, the first time on Dutch uh, national radio from border to border, Radio Veronica, uh, to feature a, a non-stop mix show. That was a real novelty back then and it was the first show where the DJ didn't talk in between or over the records and uh, part of the introduction of that show was a short interview with uh, Eric de Zwart where he asked questions and I didn't answer and after a couple of those silences he said well you know it now is clear that this is a DJ that doesn't talk and this is uh, in the mix and in the mix ran uh, from two till three in the night uh, from Friday to Saturday and as a kind of a promotion to In The Mix uh, we thought it would be a great idea to do another 20 minutes during prime time uh, in a show called uh, Bart and Van Inkel which now Bart and the Zwart which later turned into Bart and Van Inkel which then turned into the famous Curry and Van Inkel show um, so the mini mix first was a kind of 20 minute, you know, appetizer to the later show in the evening. And uh, over time, those 20 minutes kind of condensed into a shorter time where I felt it would be, you know, uh, it would be more effective to put all that work into one track to kind of make a, a remix or a mashup. Although the term mashup wasn't invented until years later uh, to come up with uh, you know a concentrated version of a track a, con a remix or a combination of a couple of tracks and uh, the one of the key things uh, behind the the mini mix was that I was making a remix intended to be to be played on radio just once so that meant I wasn't fiddling around with stuff in the background, I wasn't uh, wasting time on stuff that wasn't important. It learned me to make a remix in such a way where everything which I put in the remix should have a clear and proper fun function and should really stand out because most of the people would only hear this remix just once on radio. 
So no messing about with a little whatever in the background and everything, every second of effort put into that mix should come across and should stand out. That was one uh, big learning curve for me. And the other was uh, each and every week I was making those remixes, mashups from the best dance tracks that were around. So by the time I was finished with that track, I not only had another exercise in making an effective remix, but also a really in-depth view of what that track was all about. Learned a lot doing these uh, uh, mini mixes. And pretty soon, a lot of these mini mixes also gained attention from uh, record companies and turned into releases. Literally, the mix that was broadcasted on radio, a mix made in eight or nine hours time during that day, then making a master on tape, jumping in the car, racing like a crazy person to the radio station and playing it. And that same tape would be used uh, for a release. And uh, examples of that would be uh, Phil Collins in The Air Tonight, that remix, um, Lovely Day, Bill Withers, uh, Over the Night by The Four Seasons, uh, Alf stuck on Earth, having the idea in the morning like, uh, you know, Alf was a, a, a big hit series then, and in the morning having an idea, uh, I'm gonna make a remix of uh, Alf, uh, going through two episodes, taking all the vocal samples out of that, creating uh, a basis, putting the vocal samples on, and this thing got uh, the attention of uh, the record company, and it got released. Another example of those uh, mini mixes was uh, the weather remix. It was a horrible, horrible summer with rain, rain and more rain. And that morning it was again raining. So what I did is uh, I phoned in for the weather report. You could still do that. Uh, call a special uh, number and you would be told uh, the weather forecast. So I looked up the weather forecast in England what the number would be and uh, the one in Holland and uh, recorded the news broadcast, which also had a little weather section. So I had about, I don't know, like three minutes worth of um, newscasters uh, talking about uh, uh, the weather, made a track which started from um, something like beatbox, turning into something like 19 of Paul Hardcastle, turning into something like uh, Control by Janet Jackson, and then turning into something which later I expanded into a full track for my album, and um, made the weather uh, mini mix. And that was the mix that Armin van Buren heard, and thought like, what is going on here? And I'd so much like to do, like to be able to do this myself, and kind of, directly kicked off his uh, interest and uh, you know started his uh, like planted the seed for his career you did remixes for many big names such as phil collins bill withers sting grace jones Solomon and peppa armin van buren culture beat jam and spoon and many many more do you get personal feedback from the artist often or is it usually someone from the record company who says great remix thanks um, the contact back then was again in an era uh, before, even before mobile phones. So um, the like the main approval uh, I kind of got from uh, the artist was the fact that the mixes got released. I uh, made a remix of uh, Sting's "An Englishman in New York," uh, initially for the DMC label in England. Uh, got picked up by the record company and it got released. So that was basically the, maybe the most important feedback I got from artists um, approving a remix by this guy in Holland um, as putting it out as their official 12 inch version. And um, there were some, uh, you know, some personal um, reactions I got from artists, for example, um, Bill Withers, lovely day. Uh, he sat down and called me when he was in, in England and he was uh, back in the spotlights uh, <laughs> promoting the remix of uh, Lovely Day. And he called me and it was a, a great call. He, he thanked me 
He said, Ben, uh, I'm at a, a point in my life where, uh, you know, grandkids and all, and um, they, they hear the stories from back when, and now again, I'm in the picture. I am, you know, they are kind of experiencing uh, a part of my life which they normally only heard from stories and now they are experiencing again with uh, a track in the charts and a hit and me being on TV and I can't tell you how much this means to me so thank you very much so that was fantastic to hear something like that what is your personal favorite remix and why oh man um, That's very difficult because the funny thing is that uh, sometimes you spend the longest time on a remix and you know it is sounding just right and it sounds just perfect but it doesn't capture uh, a wider audience and then there are remixes where you're like what am I going to what am I going to do today I have no idea an hour later I still don't have any idea and then you think like Let's take the a cappella of uh, a soccer DJ and uh, I'll put this little bit of this show tune uh, under it, which was also used by Jazzy Jeff. And suddenly you come up with a version where you're like, I'm not even sure about this. And you send it out and it becomes a massive hit. So it is, it is uh, an amount of hit and miss in there. Um, I don't know. I think um, most of the times it's every time the last one which I'm working on and uh, looking back I'm just so uh, um, so fortunate that so many things which I did where I was just doing what I liked and didn't you know I wasn't bothered with what was going on what other people were doing what was in the charts I was just doing exactly what I loved and it uh, connected to the audience so yeah I don't know which uh, which one would be a favorite. I think uh, Phil Collins in the Air Tonight is a favorite of mine. And um, for other projects, for example, um, uh, maybe uh, Let's Talk About Sex by Salt and Pepper, where I got the multi-tracks and lifted the vocals from the multi-tracks and then rebuilt the whole song. Uh, got Carl Linger in uh, to do uh, new backing vocals and basically took, took the, the vocals, took uh, like the raps from the original version, turned it into a new version, um, didn't make the time for the courier at five o'clock, uh, called in and they said, well, if you bring it to Amsterdam, uh, you still have till eight o'clock, didn't make the eight o'clock deadline either. Uh, do I still have time? They said, well, the last thing we can offer you is the very last transit van going from Amsterdam to Brussels airport will be at the border with Belgium at uh, 11.30 at night, that, which gave me another couple of hours. So salt and pepper, take the multi-track, take the vocals, make a whole new track, do the engineering, do the mixing, recording the back of vocals, doing the final mix, doing the final edits, taking the tape, driving it to the border in Belgium, handing it over to the cashier at the Shell station there. Some girl, I have this for the, for the DHL courier a little later. Yeah, okay, fine. Got picked up, next morning it was in London and it was a massive, massive, massive hit all over the planet. And just imagine this cashier at the, uh, you know, at the Shell station taking the, the single and the 12-inch version of a massive, massive, huge, huge hit and just having it there beside a cup of coffee, not knowing that, it, you know, it was gonna blow up the way it uh, did. And, you know, it's probably these, uh, these mixes that have that extra story behind them that are my favorite ones. Of course, we cannot forget the legendary Grand mixes. In 1983, you started with making a year mix, which got aired at the end of December on Dutch radio. The Grand Mix contained the best tracks of the year in a one hour mix. These days year mixes are quite popular, but back in the early 80s it was not very common at all. There was no Ableton Live yet. 
Can you tell us how you made the grand mixes and how much time it took you to make them? <laughs> um, in a continuation of uh, my In The Mix show on radio, I had, I don't know, uh, somewhere halfway November the idea, wouldn't it be great to take all the best dance tracks of this year and put them in one mix? And I mean, there were already uh, like compilation mixes of a year. Uh, obviously there was Disconet and um, so there were these uh, mega mixes already going on. And the idea for uh, the year mix, because it wasn't even called the grand mix uh, the first year, two years around, was simply like taking an hour and just combining all the best dance tracks of that year in that one mix. And because it was a full hour mix, which you also didn't have on something like Disconnect because it was, you know, restrained to the 24 minutes you could cut in an uh, on a vinyl. Yeah, this became uh, the grand mix. I had the idea somewhere halfway November. Started gathering all the records, started making the mix, and it wasn't even a thing then. You know, nobody was expecting it either. And uh, yeah, the first airing. The first broadcasting of the mix also wasn't perfect because I had two reels and uh, the mixes were, you know, always recorded on what they call pancakes. So not even on a reel, but just on the metal center holding the tape. Uh, something which is done a lot in the States, but here is the way how, you know, how you took your tapes, how you put the tapes in the boxes, take it in to the studio. So I had these two styrofoam uh, platters which I grabbed and went to the studio and I also had uh, another couple of vinyls in my car and when I arrived in the studio it turned out that I had the first half of the mix with me but the second styrofoam layer I have still no idea how I managed that by but I ran out of the door with like half the mix so when the first like 35 uh, 40 minutes were done then the second part should come but the tape wasn't there it wasn't in the styrofoam holder so uh, the first time the grand mix was uh, broadcasted uh, I kind of filled it in with uh, one side of a high fashion mix I made for Dureco and then a week later the complete uh, grand mix was broadcast and that kind of started off a whole tradition on itself where I would uh, spend the whole month of uh, December making this mix for Dutch radio. And it was a great experience um, making the mix and seeing the responses. And the responses would be people mailing in, mailing, putting a sheet of paper in an envelope and sending it in and requesting the track list. That was all the, the feedback you got back then because there was no uh, there was no Facebook, there was no internet, there, was, there were no use nets, whatever. That was the old, only uh, way to get some uh, response. That's one side of the whole story. The other story, side of the story was that I would be working on this mix for the full month of December, drive to the studio, there would be no one at the studio besides the technician who needed to be there because it was his job and who might or might not be interested in dance music. So it was a, a full month of work and a full month, I mean 31 days working 10 to 12 hours a day on this mix, driving to the studio, sitting with someone who you didn't know, who might not even an interest, have an interest in what you were broadcasting, start the tape and when the tape was finished, wind it back on the reel and go home. Nobody in the studio, no claps and cheers and shouts, nobody cheering you on. It was such an anti-climax each and every year and that anti-climax even got worse because round the grand mix kind of grew this hype of the year mix and then record companies were putting their versions of year mixes out which frankly were you know they didn't even come close because they couldn't use those artists so they were kind of like yeah, I don't know 
thin representations of what the uh, year mix uh, would be and they were making big bucks and I couldn't make any money off, off of the mixes because it had Prince in there and had Madonna in there and you know you just couldn't get the tracks cleared so it was a very bittersweet experience those first 10 grand mixes spending that time not having the response seeing people stealing your mix uh, seeing it come by on bootlegs uh, finding out that people that you know for years always smile in your face and were selling your work under the counter as bootlegs not willing to share with you where the hell they came from leaving you just out in the cold so it was it, it really had two sides this whole story but it you know it, uh, it, it inspired a lot of uh, other DJs and uh, it was a big part of me making my name in those days. What can we expect of you in the near future? Oh wow. Um, well, we, we're just talking about the Grand Mix. Uh, first one started in 1983. Uh, the Grand Mix 2017, uh, which was released uh, on January 1st in, uh, of this year, uh, got into the number one position in exactly one day. It was broadcasted on the 31st of December 2017 and by noon 1st of January 2018 it was on number one in the iTunes charts. A week later it was already number one also in the, the normal sales compilation, uh, not the compilation chart but the album chart so that includes artist albums as well and I'm very fortunate that uh, so many years later I can cater to all those that love 80s and 90s and the dance classics and all that kind of stuff uh, with my program in the mix whilst at the same time reaching a complete new audience and being in a solid number one position for some several weeks with uh, the Grand Mix 2017. Um, that is one project, another project where we just released uh, part 16 of Grand 12 Inches, uh, gathering all the best 12 inch versions in uh, master quality, uh, is doing fantastic. And we've also recently started uh, a new series called Grand House Classics, where we're now at part two, featuring another 40 uh, 12 inch versions, also in master quality. And that, again, me being the nerd I am, uh, trying to achieve that you know, highest attainable quality uh, has also gathered me uh, a huge following with these series. So that's going on. What else is going on? A lot of gigs uh, throughout the country, uh, being at the Brighton Music Festival uh, at ADE at the end of uh, this year again, and um, also uh, venturing uh, back into the recordings I made for my album Iconic Groove album that was released in 2015 uh, recorded and mixed the old school way um, 17 brand new tracks brand new productions with artists like uh, Barbara Tucker and um, James D train Williams and I'm now revisiting my own productions which is the hardest thing you can do because when you make a production it kind of grows from nothing and kind of gets finessed and polished until you're really satisfied with it and now I have to throw all those careful made decisions overboard and kind of approach it with a completely fresh view which is so easy to do if you have to do it with somebody else's productions but so difficult to do if it you know concerns one of the things you've created by yourself so working on that as well and uh, keeping busy and having a good time Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. All right, that was it. My interview with Ben Lieberhand. Ben, thank you once again for your time. Much appreciated. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. Like the video and very important, make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching and until next time, bye bye.